Before we start the podcast today, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, in history, we have had some true giants in the field that have driven our culture, our lives to the next step. If we look back at philosophy, science and technology, there has been some greats from Plato to David Hume to um, Kant. In the science, we've had amazing people like Newton, Curie and Hawkins. And if we look at the technology that we're all used to using over the past few hundred years, from James Watt to Annie Eastley to Steve Jobs, all true giants in their field. But with the sad passing of Gordon Moore, a true colossus in our industry, um, my friends and colleagues um, in Edwards, we do send our condolences to the, the Moore family. Hi, I'm Stuart and welcome to our podcast, The Moore You Know. Our podcast will be looking into how the manufacture of semiconductors interacts with our everyday life. Welcome back to our podcast, The Moor You Know. Um, we are very blessed today to have a returning guest in Chris Jones. And we have got a very special guest, as we always do, but I must admit this is a very, very special guest. We've got Steve Cottle, the Senior Applications Manager from Edwards for Exhaust Management Systems. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Stuart. Hello, Stuart. So today's topic is... CFCs, PFCs, PFAS. What's a CFC? CFC is a chlorofluorocarbon. Chlorofluorocarbon. Yeah, so something that contains chlorine, fluorine, and carbon. Simple example would be CCLF3. And CLF3? No, CCLF3. CCLF3, what yep. is that? So one carbon in the centre, and it's attached to a chlorine, and three fluorines. Right, okay, got you. Uh, PFCs, Chris? Uh, similar to what Steve's just said, but replace I thought that, he was talking about CFCs. But replace the chlorine with a fluorine, and you've now got CF4, which is a PFC. So all of the, all the positions are and covered PFC with a fluorine. Stands, PFC per, stands? Per fluorocarbon. Carbon? Yes, or per, per fluorocompound. But you've got to be a bit careful because in some uh, some jurisdictions, a PFC is very definitely a carbon compound. And then you start listing the compounds such as NF3 and SF6 separately. PFAS. Um, PFAS, Chris. Polyfluoroalkyl substances or perfluoroalkyl substances. Uh, but it's a very different, this is a very different game because now you're in a, into a family, a, a very large family of compounds. Uh, that depending on where you're sitting could be 5,000 compounds or 12,000 compounds, lots and lots of compounds. So it's, it's very much a family of compounds. So thank you for that um, introduction to all the acronyms. Steve, CFCs, what was the great success about CFCs? So CFCs were noted back in the 70s and 80s as being responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer. So there was a whole creation. The ozone layer is... So there is an ozone layer around the, uh, around the planet, um, high up in the atmosphere, um, and it protects the planet from UV rays uh, coming to the Earth's surface. Um, and there was a hole uh, very much noticed over Antarctica, uh, and it was worked out that the CFCs, sorry, the... Yeah, the CFCs. Yes, we're, we're still talking we're, about we're, CFCs. Yeah, yeah, we're responsible for that whole. Um, so therefore, the world came together um, and signed up to the Montreal Protocol, which basically banned the production and use of CFCs. So the ozone layer is very high up in the atmosphere. Somewhere up there. Uh, yep, a really long way up there. Um, you know, well above you know where any commercial aircraft fly or anything like that. It's very high up in the atmosphere. Um, and it filters out UV rays um, from the sun uh, getting to the planet. Um, a bit like a fancy suntan lotion. A very fancy suntan lotion. Um, you know, technically ozone itself is toxic. You know, ozone at ground level is toxic, you know, mm. and you get ozone produced by lightning and things like that. The smell that the smell you can smell after lightning um, is ozone. Well, after it hits you. <laughs> well, after it's been very anywhere close nearby, it will, yeah, yeah, it will, yeah. you will get, you will, you it can create ozone. Um, and, but up in the upper, upper atmosphere there, it's, it's not a danger to us and it is, is protecting actually our planet. Without, without it there, you know, our planet would be in serious it's trouble. It's unique to our planet, isn't it? I think then. 
Well, our planet's pretty unique oh, anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is ozone? Because it's O3, isn't it? Ozone is a special form of oxygen. Uh, instead of O2, as in normal oxygen, uh, ozone is O3. And as Steve, it's called an allotrope. And as Steve has described, uh, it absorbs the UV light coming from the sun. Talking of that hole, with the hole there, so what? Fact, what was the hole fact, about? There was more than one. There's one in the northern hemisphere as well. But that hole, so what? So if we if that hole grew, what difference would it have made to um, the us on life on Earth? We'd probably have wiped it out um, in some ways. Um, you know, Chris high... just gave that funny look there as if maybe not. I love when it you get two scientists it's in the room. It certainly wouldn't have been wouldn't have been good news. No. I remember my next door neighbour saying she wasn't a scientist, and she said. They're all talking about UV light. And she said, I've just got a better suntan. Is that true? Would we have got a better suntan from it? And a lot more melanoma. But ah, so, so basically cancerous if we had a big hole in ozone layer. The uh, ability is the wrong phrase, really. The occurrence of skin cancers uh, depends very strongly on the wavelength of the UV radiation. And what the ozone layer is rather good at is uh, filtering out those shorter wavelengths. Uh, UV and therefore it stops uh, the UV light from damaging. It's not just us, it's plants, it's all sorts of things actually. So I'm interested in the fact, because we're in this, this climate crisis at the moment around global warming gases and we're going to talk about PFCs in a moment. What do you think it was that pre-internet, pre this instant communications, what was it, it managed to bring people together to understand and to to follow the regulations? And has it been a success, Steve? Would you say it's been a success? One could say it's been a success because the whole is repairing itself. Um, it's greatly reduced in size. Um, but pre-internet, um, you know, the internet may, may be a very good source for many things, but in some respects, actually, it can also spread a lot of misinformation. So getting a lot of people together, um, actually in a room, actually discussing things properly without... A bit lot like of our podcast. Bit like, without, without a lot of external um, influences, actually focuses the mind. Um, I, you know, if you consider you know, what it takes these days, you know, the, the way that communications spread things... I think there was a great instance back in the uh, 60s when uh, Mal uh, Martin Luther King actually had a rally in Washington and he held it within one day's notice. And yet over uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people turned up to this purely by spreading it by word of mouth. There was no internet in those days. Um, so, you know, things can travel without, uh, you know, just having to, having to be spread by the internet. So every time I speak to Chris, he always quotes me to the Paris Agreement. Was it an agreement for the CFCs? Well, that was the Montreal Protocol. Uh, so. Sorry, Chris, if I was insulting you about Paris, but you have... No, 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 I podcast. do grab it on about Paris. So that you said the... Montreal Protocol. Montreal. The Montreal, Montreal Protocol, I think, was signed in 1976, Chris. Ooh, was, uh, it, was it that long ago? I I'm, think not, it was, I'm not that I old. I think it was 1976. That's the same time as the Olympics. Are you sure you're I not getting them? Old, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. That was quite a big year for Montreal then. Uh, may well have been, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 76, the agreement signed, and everyone signed up to it straight away? No, not everybody, but mm. the majority of, comp uh, of countries uh, certainly signed up to it. Um, and then there was a subsequent agreement um, called the Kigali Agreement, to which I believe about 180 countries signed up to. Yeah, and having just checked my notes, it's 87. Oh, was it? Sorry. It's 87, 87 Montreal. Yeah, I thought it might have been a bit too much okay. of the Olympics <laughs> and the Montreal CFC yes. agreement in yes. the same year. Montreal it might have been a bit too much. <laughs> and Kigali's um, quite a lot later. So the, the internet saved you there then. It yes, is, yes. That's yeah. good. So regulation played a part. We look at PFCs now, and you mentioned the Paris Agreement, Chris. Um, do you think there's lessons to be learned from the CFC agreement from Montreal? Uh, yes, be careful what you wish for would be a good start, because ultimately... Is that you having a dig at Steve, or is um, it when you say no, be careful there are, what there you are wish un, for? there are unintended consequences. So what did we do? We took the CFCs and we decided to replace them with other gases. Like? Uh, 
Butane, H, wasn't H, it? Oh. HCFCs. So is that so like butane? And hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Yeah, so and most of the audience will be going, what's he talking about? Do you mean like butane and things no, like that? No, 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 no. Well, I read somewhere on your deodorant cans is that when they took the CFCs out, they replaced them with butane they did they did, they did in that instance but um a they lot are. of a lot of the other things like refrigerants etc got re got replaced with hcfcs and and that's a global warming gas it's it's uh, some of them can be some of them can be uh but they're less they have less impact on the ozone layer but they have an impact so on the climate impact, yes right so then we went for hfcs Hang on, let's not talk about HFCs. Let's pick HFCs. No, 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 you this, want to talk about HFCs. Yeah, yes, because, and this is part of the problem. It's all, it's all a bit of a, it's not a muddle, but it's all interrelated. So then we went for HFCs. Uh, again, lower ozone Steve, depletion. Steve, you, you seem to have a thought there when he mentioned HFCs. But hydrofluorocarbons. Yes. Hydrofluorocarbons. So, Carbons so, or compounds? Carbons, carbons. In this instance, hydrofluorocarbons. So on the simple basis, Instead of having CF4 as a perfluoro compound, mm -hmm. HFC, one would have uh, CHF3 or CH2F2, CH3F3. I love so a good compound, don't you? You love a good compound. You, love yeah. a good, you can love a good... No idea compound. what you're talking about. Okay. But, but you've got compounds there. Um, uh, so, for example, now they, they tend to use those HFCs, or specifically some of those HFCs, for refrigerants. Um, don't have the in, really any effect on the ozone layer, but they do have um, or can have high global warming Is that potentials. when they're in operation or when they're thrown on the scrap heap? If they're released. Doesn't matter right. uh, when they're released. Okay, so CFC have picked one at the resolved or the resolving one issue as we see the ozone hole reduce if we continue with our actions now. We've possibly contributed to global warming gases. So that moves us nicely on to PFCs. Um, anyone want to take what that is? Because I heard you talking earlier. Per. Per. Fluoro. And here it comes. Is it compound or carbon? Steve, are you a, car a carbon or are you a compound guy? It can be either. So oh, quite, quite often geez, people here we say... Go again. I hate putting two scientists <laughs> in the room and you go, it could be either. I think there's so going to be... So right, okay. perfluoro compounds you know, or perfluoro carbons. At the end of the day, what people will end up talking about when it comes to the greenhouse gases is they may well say perfluoro compounds or they will say perfluoro carbons and... NF3 and SF6, because those are the two compounds right. that are also very high greenhouse gas potential uh, compounds that get bunch grouped into the same thing. So we've got two PFCs, compounds or carbons. Does that affect how we manage it going forward from regulatory point of view? There's limited regulations, actual regulations on... Um, PFC emissions. Is that strictly true? I thought Taiwan had um, regulations on PFCs, did they not? Uh, no, when you every, mean regulations, you mean... Essentially everyone signed up to... Uh, nearly everyone has signed up to Paris. Right. So, and remember what's Paris And Paris about. was again... Conference of parties, COP meeting, where they signed up to uh, restricting global warming to either one and a half degrees C or substantially less than two degrees C from pre-industrial age. And that was COP20... COP15, wasn't COP 15. it? COP15. See, I do uh, learn something from our podcast. Right. Steve, is that right? 21, COP21. COP21. Wow. 2000, 2015. Maybe we do need a lawyer in the room. 2015. Yeah, 2015. That's yeah, where yeah. I got it wrong, but yeah. the scientists anyway. Let's move on. So regulations of CFC was a success, we'd agree, but it did introduce another problem potential with HFCs. Well, I mean, those, those uh, so, so, so the PFCs, HFCs, um, you know, have been used and... Uh, in other industries anyway. So, for example, in the semiconductor industry, there was some use of CFCs, not much. Um, but the use of PFCs is something that is, um, I was, how can one put it, it's, it's needed at the moment within the semiconductor industry. There's certain processes that currently don't have any alternatives to using certain PFC or HFC gases. That's an interesting point because... Moving on to PFAS, we're going to have the similar challenges with PFAS. Chris, would you just like to explain again what we were talking about PFAS? What do you use PFAS 
oh my, I'm going to say compounds. Am I saying the right thing? P PFAS compounds in, in everyday use. Well, actually, no, you don't have to call them. They are all compounds, but it's substances. So that's what the S stands for. <sighs> okay, um, <laughs> substances, yeah. the thing to remember is that the, on the bro in the broadest definition, um, many of the HFCs and, um, and the PFCs are PFAS. So... But uh, so, okay, take the science out of it. Where, where have we got PFAS sitting in now? Yes. And why is it a concern to us? Uh, so PFAS sits pretty much where we've been discussing for PFCs and HFCs and CFCs. Refrigerants, uh, in uh, aerosols, in firefighting foams, in blowing agents uh, for uh, insulation, um, in coatings. I in... actually heard that the other day there, it was actually even in toilet rolls. Uh, it probably is to make them a bit more slippy. Slippy. Well, I oh, no right, idea. I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah, and the, uh, well, surely that depends on which environment you're in, Chris. Steve's <laughs> looking at me thinking, please don't ask me <laughs> the next question on toilet rolls. Carpets. Carpets, yeah. Um, uh, all sorts of things. But the piece Clo passes. Clothing as well, you know, so Clo your, yeah. your, you know, your cycling we'll jackets, etc. cetera. Um, and I can assure you, I don't think my cycling jacket has any PFAS in it because the last couple of days it's been raining really heavily and it just went right through. So it's a waterproofing you're talking about and coatings yeah, in waterproofing general. waterproofing and coatings, yeah. yeah. So PFAS, environmental hazard to both soil, water, and then I take it if it's in the soil and water, it will also be to humans. Yeah, the, the problem with PFAS is um, m there's a multitude of problems. Uh, we've sort of mentioned, we well, we have mentioned the potential for global warming. Uh, we have uh, some of the compounds will be mobile within the environment so they can get around. Uh, if they get into rain, they can get into soil. If they get into soil, uh, they can get into water. If they get into water, they can get into us. Um, and, and this is essentially what they found. What's the consequences of them getting into us? Well, mm, it depends on the nature of the compound. I've got a quote from my list here. And you can find uh, some compounds causing birth defects, some compounds causing cancers. Increased cholesterol. Uh, and diabetes. Liver enzymes. And, and, yeah, hormone but, disruptions, high blood pressure. Preeclampsia. Yeah, but how much of this is known and how much of this is speculated? Well, I think so. And, that, and this is part of the problem. With such a broad family of compounds, it's actually that the evidence will probably be there for a limited number of compounds, but not for all compounds. But surely the aspect of this, if one thing to learn from climate change, is you're going to have the people who believe you and the people who don't. CFCs, everyone went, whoa, this is a problem, let's do something about it. Global warming gases, everyone's going, yes, it is, no, it's not. So, yes, it is. And we still have a lot of deniers. Is the fact that on PFAS, uh, is there a, a fact that maybe we go too far in frightening people to do something? Steve, what do you think about regulations? Where would you put the regulations so for PFAS? So if one considers, I'm going to go back actually a bit to the PFCs, mm -hmm. because if you consider, you know, what you say about deniers and, you know, and approvers, et cetera, you know, with global warming as opposed to the hole in the ozone layer, global warming is something that actually affects um, the economies. You know, the majority of the gases, the majority of the, the, of the gas that causes the issues with global warming is CO2. Mm -hmm. So, you know, energy production, decarbonize the grid. That's the desire really for the reduction mm -hmm. in, in global warming so that you can meet the requirements of the Paris Agreement. Um, now that has a very big implication on any nation that wishes to grow, that wishes to grow its economy. It need, you know, they want to do things um, like have power stations. Um, and if the cheapest way of doing that is to have a coal-fired power station because they've got coal, then that's what they want to do. Um, uh, there's not even so, developing nations, even some developed nations still like to use coal because indeed it's they do. the easiest um, way. Indeed they do, and they still wish to use that, and they still wish to use that so that they can get keep their industries going. Um, but again, that's a journey for every nation to take itself through, to decarbonise the grid. Um, so CO2 is the big problem there. So, And regulating that is very difficult. Um, targeting a regulation on something like the PFCs it will have much less of an effect. And in fact, possibly the better thing there is some of the um, voluntary 
uh, re reductions that things like the semiconductor industry have tried to do. So lessons learned for moving to PFAS? Is it because that this one, CFC seem to directly affect the human being, so we'll do something. Climate change does, but there's so many indirect parts. Is there an aspect of PFAS if you Google or you do internet research um, on your search engine and you put PFAS in, do you think there's, there's an overemphasis on the dangers to humans? And is that a plan just to make people like CFC go, oh, this is a danger? for the regulation, or do you think regulation is more on the scientific research aspect you see in PFCs and global warming gases? I think we were dealing with something like a couple of hundred uh, HFCs, PFCs. Um, let me remind us that the scale of the PFAS problem is thousands. Um, and therein lies the problem it needs but not all of them could be a risk are they no and it needs to be da data driven there's already regulations so i think it's 33 pfos pfoa uh, which are all pfas compounds have already been banned um the and they're covered by the stockholm convention on persistent organic pollutants the new PFAS regulations that are being generated in uh, that are being discussed in Europe at the moment, there's a propensity to politicise. Uh, one politician was heard to say, "I'm going to ban all perfluoro, all PFAS, and why am I banning all PFAS? Because it kills babies." Well, that's hopeless. We can't have those sorts of discussions. But if you're talking about PFAS, I worry where this conversation is going with PFAS because if you're talking about um, thousands of yes. compounds or um, solutions, did you call it? No, comp uh, compounds. Substances. 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 If you're talking about thousands of them, if we wait for all the data to come in, surely then we're not gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna be too late. The, the, the ones we know the data on, are we regulating them? Like we mentioned the Paris Agreement for Global Warming, the Montreal Agreement for CFCs. But the, is there an agreement on PFAS? Yeah, but you need you need to be a little careful. The Paris Agreement generates guidelines mm -hmm. that countries sign up to voluntarily. Uh, they're nationally determined contributions where countries are looking to reduce the releases of greenhouse gases to control global warming. Uh, the uh, where we start impacting health. Uh, health of society, then essentially regulations start getting drawn up. Um, so, we, you know, we started with uh, the Montreal uh, Montreal Accord uh, for C uh, CFCs, Kigali for HFCs. Um, and uh, there are laws being passed by all major jurisdictions on, uh, on those compounds uh, and... F gases and all sorts of things. And it's all getting a bit interrelated. Uh, so PFAS as another F compound uh, will be part of that. Mm. Now, a lot of, the, uh, a lot of the regulatory authorities are trying to ensure that the amount of these compounds that gets into drinking water is controlled, uh, which is why the major usage, the ones you described, um, the major uses uh, in, in surface treatment for carpets, etc. Uh, everyone is trying to work out where these compounds are used and essentially stopping them from being released. We're not waiting. There's no plan to wait and for all 12,000 or all uh, 5,000, whichever uh, jurisdiction you're sitting in. There's going to be some targeted uh, regulations coming up. Um, in fact, there's already targeted regulations in place, uh, but those will those will increase. Uh, but as we learn more and more, uh, so the number of compounds that gets covered will increase, as well as the handling of those compounds. How do you how do you treat waste PFAS? Uh, do you incinerate it? Do you treat it chemically? Uh, how do you stop these compounds getting into the environment? Uh, and then degrading to form PFAS that could cause Steve, problems. Steve, don't you think we should just stop using PFASs rather than we seem to use them rather than um, stop using them, use something else, and then we won't have to try and get rid of them? Well, you say use something else, but again, it's finding the environmental you know, effects of the something else. Um, 
I so guess, your waterproof you know, jacket, your Teflon frying pan, you, and the list goes on where PFAS is, uh, are in. Is there not something that, you know, should we, we not just stop We didn't used to have uh, Teflon coated frying pans. We didn't used to have, um, you know, coated rain jackets. They were wax coated and things like that beforehand. Um, you could go back to that. They may, you know, maybe mm. the wax coated ones weren't so breathable. So, you know, mm. if you went cycling, it's not going to breathe. You're going to sweat inside it. Mm. Um, it's a bit like, you know, as I think as I mentioned, you know, for some of the semiconductor gases, there are certain gases that do certain things that you can't get away from. Maybe Chris can, can say that there are some compounds that will do that in, in the PFAS world, but it's, as he says, it's such a big, huge range of, mm -hmm. of compounds there and substances that it's a bit more difficult to actually um, categorise them into different work streams of these are essential you know we need to have these ones um you know these ones less so these ones we can definitely get rid of oh actually there's some in you know and but then you also probably got to look at that as a matrix as well actually you know these ones are the ones that are really dangerous these ones are less dangerous um these ones don't have any effect at all um and you've got thousands of compounds there to do that with. so we've got um, regulations coming in now then to protect us uh, Steve, I would like to add Steve's use the key word there, which is essentiality. Uh, essentiality. In other words, where something is essential, um, the if uh, if a material is essential to maintain us, us moving forward technically. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, if we now just turned around and said we will get rid of all PFAS in the EU by 2028 then the semiconductor industry would leave the EU and we wouldn't be able to import any semiconductor chips. Where do we use PFAS again in semiconductors? Uh, in the uh, CF4, in the... Oh, right, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, yeah. In, in te Teflon, for, in Viton, in mm -hmm. uh, the oils so and lubricants. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. In lots of different places uh, within the manufacturing So it wouldn't just process. be the semiconductor industry, it would be nearly every manufacturing industry would go, oh... But are they always essential? That's mm. the question that needs to be asked. And then the next question that needs to be asked, okay, so you've now got some essential uses. How are you going to control their releases to right. minimize okay, their releases? That makes sense, yeah. um, how are you going to identify the compounds moving forward that are the key compounds from a health and safety viewpoint, whether that's a, uh, 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 an immediate health and safety viewpoint or one moving forward? And that one moving forward is always a bit of a challenge. Would, you, um, would you consider something like Teflon, though, to be a hazard to Teflon's a trademark, health? isn't it? Uh, well, okay, polytetrafluoroethane. <laughs> um, <laughs> good one, I like that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, is Teflon in itself... Uh, is Teflon in itself a hazard? The trademark Teflon. Uh, sorry, PTFE, if we want to go for PTFE. Then uh, it's certainly classified as a PFAS. Uh, am I aware of problems with PTFE? As bulk PTFE, I'm not aware of anything, but I'm not a health and safety expert. Mm -hmm. However, if I were to put Teflon on a frying pan and I were to take its temperature... Uh, much above 250 C, then I might suddenly find it's giving off some compounds I don't want to see. If I have PTFE very finely ground, I might find it in places where there's a degradation path. So I think it, the, the, evidence is, the evidence isn't there for most of the PFASs. The understanding of CFC, clear and immediate danger that people understood or were brought to understand. Global warming, activities, it's on a journey, we're moving the discussion down. PFAS, I feel as if we're at the start of that journey. PFAS, we've identified as an environmental hazard to people, animals, and the nature we live in. How do you convince people to go on that journey, the CFC journey? Is it a hazard or is it a potential hazard? Because when you've got 5,000 compounds, some of them will be a hazard, some of them will be less of a hazard, some of them will be no hazard at all. Is those, that the case? Or those, are they, are those, they absolutely all a hazard? Oh no, oh, mm. I, I can't say unequivocally no to that one, but the, um, certainly some are a known hazard. So and, let, those, right. and those I've, have either been or will be banned. So let's make it clear, because remember, is, so PFAS, 
within PFAS is a generic term yes. for saying certain substances that we use in our manufacturing processes can be a hazard to humans and to the environment that we live in. Yes. Whether it's in the ground that we grow our food or the water where we drink or we eat from, fish, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is an aspect of PFAS. So what are we doing about, we've identified there is a problem. We, uh, we have identified that potentially there's a bigger problem, but what are we doing about the problem we've identified with PFAS now? A substantial amount, a substantial amount of the effort is being expended on trying to establish where we use these compounds and how those how the uh, how the movement of those compounds uh, from an import export right. so let's let's go back to your so first it's thing. control it's control of where the material an understanding of the amount and the where the materials are used what, what do you think about the quantification of hazards you know i mean you say yes they banned some of them and some of them are going to be banned but that probably leaves or you know let's say 4000 out of the, so those 5000 chemicals out there probably be where more. they have have they quantified the hazards related no no to it's those? ongoing activity so let me take you back but, but bearing, back bearing in mind epidemiological studies take a long time right let's go back use PFAS yes where are the hazardous ones we've identified used so some of the PFAS is yes. so PFOS is we got rid of P know, and PFOS and PFOA what's a PFOS a perfluorooctane sulfonate and what are they used in I they don't know they were used in the lithography processes yeah, but they'll be used for... And plenty of other things. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. relating to the semiconductor industry, yeah. Right, yeah. they were used in the lithography. And in lithography, they've been replaced by other PFAs now, have they not? Uh, PFAS. Other PFAS, yes, yes, which is always a bit of a problem. So when you get, yeah. two, chemi when you get two chemists and two scientists in the room, <laughs> I'm here to bring it back. So we use PFAS in a lot of things we take for granted nowadays yes so whether it generally coating whether it's in clothes or whether it's in uh, carpets carpets and everyday items that we take for granted so we don't want to frighten the life out of everyone cause, but cosmetics cosmetics we talked about that earlier like the firefighting firms, firefighting equipment blowing agents for food insulators. packaging for but them. what you're saying is we we know there is a potential yes and i think the potential danger we know it's around forever we know that it's where people have started to measure it, is that we find it in our water, in our um, everyday environment, in nature in general, in our food chain, in, in us, in and us. even on our toilet roll. I have to bring the toilet roll yes. in again. How, how do we resolve it? Firstly, it's quantify what we use, where we use. And because there's 5,000, 10,000 chemicals, that's going to be a challenge. But that's a lot of where the regulations are targeting. Uh, then what do you really need it for? Don't use it where you don't need it. Steve mentioned essential. Uh, essentiality is key. Uh, where it is non-essential, uh, look for the alternatives. Uh, Steve mentioned that. Uh, where it is essential, start looking for alternatives. And where it's essential and there aren't any alternatives, uh, ensure that you're controlling, controlling use and releases responsibly. Uh, at the end of the day, something we need to remember is there was a definition of green chemistry and part of the definition of green chemistry was ensure that you're tailoring your chemistry such that your materials degrade. Um, so we could hardly count these particular family of chemicals as green chemistry. So in summing up, what would you say our audience today should take away from our podcast, Steve? Part of it is about immediacy. Um, you know, CFCs were banned because there was an immediate threat. And that was to, the ozone layer. In the ozone layer. You know, if the ozone layer uh, were to disappear, then there would be a very immediate threat to the planet. Um, in global warming terms, that threat is much of a longer term one. Um, you know, since the Industrial Revolution started, the greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 levels, have risen. And climate change, slowly but surely, has been occurring. You know, there has been the rise in temperature of the planet slowly but surely. And it's increasing because the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing. So it's something that um, everybody is having to work towards now. It's becoming more of an immediate threat. Uh, and hence you now have targets, you know, whether they be 2030, 2040, 2050 mm. to get targets. Um, your net zero targets. Your net zero targets. Um, 
Things like PFAS, though, you know, where there have been ones that have been very quickly identifiable, they have been banned, a bit like the uh, CFCs. But because there's such a broad spectrum of compounds, um, they have to be looked at in more detail, categorized, um, and the threat level assessed before making a decision as to whether to ban them or not. Chris, would you agree with Steve's takeaway? Do you think that's uh, insightful? Uh, so with regards to PFAS, you'll have noticed that a lot of these compounds are very heavily related. Uh, so PFAS in particular, there's thousands of compounds. How do we know where they're used? Well, that we need to work out. How do we know which ones are hazardous? We've already done that to an extent. That research needs to continue. Uh, are some of them going to be essential in use? Yes, they are. Uh, if we can't replace them, then we have to control them tightly. Steve, Chris, we've came to the end of the podcast. Thank you very much for a very informative discussion on CFCs, PFCs and PFAS and hope to see you again in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. If you want to know more, please go to our website where um, we will be able to pass on to you some more of our knowledge that we hopefully have passed on to you today. 